for that. I want to introduce um, Matt, though, who's our next speaker, and um, move on to, to some uh, clinical work. Matt was late arriving last night in Nottingham, so the pressure was on a bit for him to write his um, biography. Uh, but it did a good job. It took him about 40 minutes or so. <laughs> <laughs> it's because he said, do it in under 40 characters and include spaces. He, he actually counted every space. Um, and then he's bracketed off the words that ran over the 140. <laughs> um, Matt is the lead clinical physiotherapist at the Royal Bournemouth... And Christchurch Hospital. And Christchurch like Hospital. Do no, I'm, do I'm doing it. Shut up, shut up. <laughs> he's also an ESP in rheumatology. E, and that's and that's where it starts. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I can't I can't read out that, that last bit. <laughs> Thanks, Roger. Uh, Matthew Lowe, everybody. Thank you. Right. So, what a fantastic venue. Um, and I'm very humbled to be here, particularly amongst peers. So um, I'm just going to start off with a little bit of background and then we'll get into the nitty gritty. And what I'm hoping to do is to translate some of this abstract theory and put it into practice. Now, if I'm getting filmed, there's a tendency for me to move around a little bit. So there's a challenge with that. So I'll try and speak very loudly. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> So, so I, come from, I, I, I work at Bournemouth Hospital on the south coast, um, and this is a view from the hospital, beautiful. Uh, another view is that. Um, so so when, when we look at the world, our perspective is extremely important, but it's not just about us, it's about the people that we look after. So I, I um, have been thrown into the management of back pain. So, um, so I'm a lead clinician physiotherapist, I work as an extenoscope practitioner in back pain in the rheumatology service. I work alongside a consultant, uh, spinal surgeon, uh, and um, in physiotherapy terms, I tend to treat people with spinal-related pain. Um, so my personal journey, um, had training and education, which was, which was underpinned by a biomedical model, and, and I think for good reason too, and we'll, we'll come to that, and Alan Taylor's here appropriately, um, and educated within the biopsychosocial model. Um, the biopsychosocial model is a useful approach, but what can happen is, is that it gets separated into three distinct entities. We get three different types of diagnoses. You get a biological set of diagnoses, you get a psychological set of diagnoses, and then you get a sociological set of diagnoses. Can we still, has that really helped us move on with the management of this patient? Um, I'm, I have an interest in clinical reasoning, um, so as you are all aware of the various forms of clinical reasoning, hypothetical deductive reasoning, diagnostic reasoning, narrative reasoning. And so what I'm hoping to do today is to see how does this, 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 this philosophy, how does this change our clinical practice, indeed does it at all? And, and also how does this inform our research and our reasoning when it comes to classification systems? Okay, so, so that's a part of it, but, it, but it's not everything. So well, how did I get involved in philosophy? Um, I did a, a, a master's, um, I'm very humbled to be with my uh, uh, educators, Nikki Petty and, and Colette Rydell, um, who um, introduced me to the idea of looking at things differently, and I did my master's uh, dissertation on motor control and musculoskeletal physiotherapy. As a result of that, um, I had to really get to understand philosophy. If you are doing a concept analysis and you want to understand meaning, you need to understand what concepts are. Uh, and concepts are extremely challenging. We'd like to think this is very simple and straightforward, but it's not. Um, and then I came across other people who seem to have a bit of an interest in philosophy, such as Roger Kerry, an old paper by him, uh, and Matt Maddox, I think. Um, and then we came across some other papers, analysis of scientific tree status and controlled rehabilitation trials, where most um, uh, rehabilitation trials are more false than true. Uh, and I kind of stepped back and went, oh no. What does this mean for my clinical practice? And then a causation, uh, causation and evidence-based uh, practice and ontological review. So how we view the world would imply exactly what we do in clinical practice and how we build what we believe is knowledge. Um, and his, uh, uh, I'm sorry, their following follow-up paper at the borders of medical reasoning, etiology and ontological challenges of medically unexplained symptoms. So as most of you know, back pain is predominantly non-specific in nature. And what does that mean? 
causation is involved in everything we do as clinicians. Um, and therefore, having a short introduction to the philosophy of causation, which is what uh, uh, Stephen and Rani uh, 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 produced, it's a, it's a great read and a look, and also getting causes for powers. So this is their particular philosophical view on causation. So why are we interested in causation? Well, people are coming to us because they want to have a, an understanding of what's going on. And also, not just that, when we try an intervention, why does that treatment seem to work for this particular person? All of these basic questions are underpinned by an idea of causation, what causation is. Um, and when we talk about interventions, this permeates into our research, our clinical understanding, and it's at the foundation of everything we do as physiotherapists. Twitter. <laughs> so Twitter, Twitter was one of the primary kind of communication mediums that I got involved in the project. And what I think Twitter is great is it provides a platform for discussion, of which we have a certain Adam Eakins in the audience, who uh, very, he likes to throw social media bombs and then see what happens afterwards. So, so if I just paraphrase, well, in fact, I'll just read it out. Physios are getting into philosophy, which is great, but remember, philosophy leaves our view of the world unchanged. Science adds to the view. So hopefully by the end. <laughs> so hopefully by the end of this, you put it out there now, Adam. Hopefully, hopefully what we can do, hopefully what we can do is, is, is to, to re-evaluate uh, re that and, and see. And, and like most things happen in clinical practice, but also how we evaluate research, things change over time. Okay, so. Musculoskeletal conditions, the impact we get, um, as you all are aware, low back pain, for example, is continuing to increase. So in comparison to, say, circulatory disorders, conditions and respiratory conditions, this is a Peter O'Sullivan slide, it's very, very clear that we continue to have problems with musculoskeletal conditions, despite ever-increasing technologies, randomised control trials, and all of these tools that we have in our boxes, we still struggle to manage certain conditions. If we look at a patient with back pain, are we treating somebody just with back pain? A great study by, um, it was the Hunt study in Norway, and what they've done is they've, they've basically looked at a number of conditions and, and, calcul and, and calculated uh, that the significant number of them are comorbid conditions. When we treat somebody with back pain, we are treating somebody with uh, um, three plus diseases. So, um, so of this population, uh, if you look at the bottom line, 1,825 had a, uh, no other disease, a significant number had another, uh, and so on. And this is uh, displayed in Venn diagrams. So if we treat people with musculoskeletal conditions, we're not treating people with musculoskeletal conditions. We are treating people with gastrointestinal problems, mental health problems, dental problems and cardiovascular problems, to name just a few. So how can we treat distinct single entities? Is that a right way to view the world? So what we have here are two scientific cultures. And then as physiotherapists, we try to bridge this gap. On one side, we have a biological uh, uh, so a biomedicine perspective, a scientific perspective, which very much is grounded within natural sciences. And on the other, the psychosocial, if we use Engel's model, is very much based in humanistic science. So physiotherapist tries to bridge this gap, but for very good reason, and it tries to negotiate it, it will often refer back to biomedicine. And that can be associated with a number of things, particularly diagnosis of exclusion is quite powerful. Uh, Adam's latest blog, for example, talks about a diagnosis of exclusion may have been a part of him getting over his back pain recently, which is you know, quite a very useful narrative. Um, and you know, if we are engaging with psychosocial uh, phenomena, we also need to embrace philosophy as part of a humanistic science. When we look at the complexity of interaction, I'm not going to try and explain the slide side, <laughs> but what I'm trying to engage in, what, what we do with physiotherapists is, is, is very, very challenging. It is very, very complex. We need to have a number of different elements of theoretical knowledge, uh, clinical impl uh, implementation, and relate that to the patient. But what I'm not trying to do is just put these as distinct items, hence the little hash line. 
but what we need to do is see if we can how, how can we engage this and, and, what, and how can we make sense of all of this information. A key aspect of people with low back pain is diagnostic uncertainty. And I'm sure that's a problem for us as much as it is for the, ther uh, for the people that we treat. Um, so, for example, patients' bel belief about the origin of the pain uh, and their cognitive processes of pain-related information have been shown to be associated with a poor prognosis. So causation is absolutely uh, fundamental to answering some of these questions. Higher levels of depression and disability were found in those with diagnostic uncertainties. The impact is quite powerful. Um, uh, as you are all aware, that low back pain is a complex, multi-dimensional problem. It's commonly used in, uh, sorry, commonly in clinical practice. Uh, pain is considered from a purely biomedical perspective where radiological imaging is the basis for diagnosis. I think in some respects that's well-founded because there are people who are suffering, they have been in pain for a long period of time, and we do need to use a diagnostic procedure to make sure that we are treating something that is non-specific. Uh, radical imaging is poorly correlated with pain and disability. While it's recognised that low back pain is a multidimensional biopsychosocial disorder, only 10% of classification systems incorporate this biopsychosocial system, which has its problems, um, but into a clinical framework. So if we think about classifications, um, they don't necessarily um, evaluate the multidimensional nature of the problem. So we have lots of different views of causation which Rani and um, uh, Stephen have, have discussed. So we've got this idea of a monocausal model. You have somebody with a condition A, you treat them with uh, B, they get the C outcome. It's unidirectional, it goes from left to right, it's repeatable, and we can do it time and time again and we get the same outcome. As we all know, that doesn't seem to work in clinical practice. We can apply a multifactorial model of causation where people with certain types of conditions, you can try, well, they have these characteristics in here, factor A, B, and C. If they, they all combine to create a critical change, so such, such as, uh, um, I don't know, uh, hypertension, and it will manifest as coronary artery disease. But, but again, th there's problems with that, because surely if you address factors A, B, and C, which might be lifestyle, smoking, and age, which you, which you can't change, um, then, then there's problems associated with this. What I think seems to make much more sense is the use of a vector model. So a vector model uses a dispositionist ontology. So what does that mean? It basically means that uh, things, uh, sorry, causal powers will tend towards an effect or against, tend towards or against an effect. It doesn't necess necessitate it. So for example, if I drop a mug on the floor, it will have a high disposition or a greater disposition to break because of the properties of the forces and the property of the uh, glass or cup to break. How many times have we dropped a cup and it hasn't broken? And you think, oh, God, how did that, how did that, how did that, how did that not happen? So there are lots of examples where we can think that things are going to happen, but they don't necessarily happen. So this idea of tendency is, I think, quite a powerful way to think about not only causal um, causation for uh, a manifestation of a symptom, but also what we can do to treat it. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. So in this model, we have a thin li a line in the middle, and we have a threshold of effect, which is called T. And then we have these powers, which are seen as vector arrows, which tend towards or against. If we look at uh, if we look at the resultant arrow, which is R, there is a tendency for this particular power to head towards G, but not necessarily enough to create an effect. To create an effect, it means to cross a threshold. Okay. So you're probably thinking, hold on a minute, <laughs> slow down. This is very much a dynamic model. This changes contextually in time. And I'm going to develop that idea a bit more in a second. But I wanted to introduce that model just so that we can get some basis, some, some background. Okay, so I started to think about different types of modelling. How can we look at somebody who has, uh, let's say, a pain problem? Um, Any time we do a graphic, 
it's extremely limiting because it cannot, you, you cannot put the detail into a graphic that you can explain. And so there are challenges to this. What I've tried to do is I've tried to look at the systems which will have some form of effect when it comes to pain. At the bottom part of this central line, we've got per the peripheral, or nociception, should we say, um, or, or things which will tend towards nociception. And then at the higher levels, we have a brain uh, or compartmentalised brain structures which have been purported to uh, have a function towards a manifestation of pain. And what I've tried to do with this, and it's problematic, is that uh, I believe that we have not just a top-down model, but we have a top-down model and a bottom-up model. So the higher levels of causation in this particular version, in terms of higher senses in the brain, will contextualise the incoming information from the external world. It's contextualised and it can suppress or facilitate lower levels of causation. And lower levels of causation still have a causal power which come up. So there are problems because philosophers will say, well, you know, one set of philosophers say, well, this is a bottom-up process. If we understand physics, we understand biology, chemi uh, sorry, chemistry, biology, and so on. And we have another uh, group of philosophers who say, well, we need to understand top-down processes first. And I'm not sure this is work in progress, but at, at the moment, I think it's a, it's a bi-directional process, but with a causal power which is stronger from high levels of causation. And this is contextualised from external environmental considerations, such as social, political, social economic, lifestyle factors. All of these things can interact, and they do so. And we see that when we see our patients. So it's a theoretical model. It's not complete. It's just a, some of the thinking that I've been working on. <coughs> Having a dispositional view of causation, I think, has been really useful. And I'm going to use a case study in a second to make sense of it. I think if we think about a traditional method of treatment, it's, it's defined across a linear path. So you, have an ass you assess somebody, you come up with a diagnosis, you treat that diagnosis, you get established some idea of causality, and then you get an outcome. So A, B, C, mononeural or neuron model. Whereas if we look at a dispositional perspective, I think we can manage multifactorialism, if that's such a concept, but it goes beyond that because it's dispositional in nature. It's not unidirectional, it's bidirectional. And that's what I'm going to come to on in a second. And this, I think, factors for biological systems far better. As an aside, it's non-categorical or classification specific. So you're not necessarily using a singular approach. I'm not going to come in, I'm going to do McKenzie, I'm a McKenzie therapist, I'm going to do a McKenzie approach. Or uh, you fit a certain pattern of a clinical presentation, I'm going to apply what I think about that clinical presentation for you. And I think the system uses better uh, understanding of non-linear interaction. And most importantly, I believe it's context sensitive. It's a... Um, I didn't realise, oh, it came out better than I thought it did, actually. Okay. So the use of dispositions in practice, I think, can impact on the way we communicate with our patients, how we collaboratively, uh, collaboratively clinically reason, how we can facilitate behaviour tech change, and it's a person-centred educational approach. And those are some of the dimensions that I think this has an advantage of in. So, how do I use it in clinical practice? Um, the patient's narrative is so important to derive the context, and you all use that now already in clinical practice. I try to denote it in a mind map, and that mind map, which is written down, which I'll show you an example of in a case study in a second, is co-constructed. It's not my view of the world, it's the person I'm trying to treat and my view of the world all at the same time. And the person who I'm treating has the ability to change that at any stage. A dispositional perspective used in the vector model means that there are factors about that patient that will tend towards or against the manifestation of their problem, it being non-specific low back pain, for example. It, as I've mentioned before, multifactorial, non-linear, it recognises individuality, variation, context sensitivity. And I think this approach 
can help with a labelling or sense of judgment. So as soon as a person is diagnosed with non-specific low back pain, a biomedical explanation for their symptoms cannot be established. So therefore, people may believe that you are telling them that this problem is psychological or social in nature. And as soon as you do that, you get into problems. People don't feel believed. They don't feel invested in. You lose your rapport and the patient's needs are not identified. So there has to be a better way. Um, I think this approach recognises change in a way that avoids probability or likelihood. Um, and the, even the word, the use of tendency, I think avoids this idea of necessity. So, for example, there's a tendency for you to move in a particular way. It's context dependent. We don't always move in this way. Yet when we look at the physiotherapy models of practice, we'll see that people are streamlined in these categories of extension dysfunction, for example, uh, active extension, passive extension, flexion phenomena. You see what I mean? And, and so, so if we say that there is a tendency for somebody to move in a certain direction, what we're saying is, is, is that there are patterns of movement that they fall into, but what we're not doing is labeling the person with a certain cat characteristic. And I think that's very powerful. <coughs> when we talk to people in terms of facilitating behavior change, if we think in a non-categorical way, I think that seems to help change behaviour. It's open-minded, it's person-led, it's balanced and non-judgmental, which is key. Um, observations that recognise relative thinking but not alternative thinking. So, so what we're saying is, is that, this is all, that, that, that these factors are relative to each other. Um, this isn't just a haphazard, we're just going to try everything approach. It's very interpretive, it's sense-making, and a big factor with people with non-specific low back pain, chronic low back pain, is, is that they, they, they have a, a reduced sense of what is going on, and they feel that they cannot have their message heard by the therapist. This approach that I'm going to be talking about in some detail in a second is underpinned by some models. So trans-theoretical model of change, motivation interviewing has, that has been brought up, uh, self-determination theory and self-efficacy theory. Uh, the purpose of my presentation is not to go into those models in detail, but um, we can discuss them at a later time. If, I, um, if, we use, uh, if we think about dispositions as usually with person-centred education, we do know that educational methods have been shown to produce beneficial outcomes for people with low back pain. But, uh, oh, and also, that, that it's, a, it's a significant component of modern healthcare. But yet many clinicians have a difficult, uh, appear to have limited methods. We're, we're not taught to be educators. So when we, when we come out of clinical practice, we don't know uh, pedagogy, andragogy. We don't understand necessarily uh, educational methods. Uh, and educational skills are merely assumed. Uh, so you're a healthcare professional, you're a physiotherapist, you know how to educate. Um, in terms of communication, there's a growing body of evidence to support the link between patient-provided communication and rehabilitation outcomes, and linking the collaborative reasoning approach that I'm going to propose in a second. It's a person-centred as opposed to cantered uh, education uh, process, and, and I believe it facilitates uh, behavioural change. Um, so, just on that point before I move on, communication, sense-making, rapport is important. There's a really interesting study by Berger and Villaume, which looked at a conceptualised approach to learning and teaching motivation interview. And they found that two main factors were required to improve or facilitate behaviour change. And they were addressing the person's issue and establishing therapeutic rapport. So it's not enough for us to establish a good rapport with a person. And equally, it's not good enough just to address the issue but the two together have an uh, additive or synergistic uh, outcome. And I believe this is because there is a, an agreed sense-making, it's interpretive and collaborative approach, um, and this, this approach is likely to help with behaviour change. Let's get to the integrity. So that's some of the theory. Let's talk about it to apply to a real patient case study. So I want to apply this to a guy called Richard. He's a 34-year-old chap. He's had a five-year history of worsening low back pain, one-year history of intermittent left sciatica, worsening disability, and he's very distressed, 
He's had unsuccessful conservative treatment, which included a lumbar epidural and physiotherapy treatment. He went to see a spinal surgeon who diagnosed him with a degenerative disc at L5-S1 and no focal neural compromise, and referred to, the uh, sorry, referred to the surgeons for an opinion, and they felt that fusion would be his own option. So uh, that was um, not uh, felt appropriate and referred back to physiotherapy. I think he would have undergone a fusion had the surgeon felt, uh, if, if, if the surgeon was felt pushed. Hands up. How typical is this of a patient that you see in clinical practice? Pretty much all of us. Okay, so how do we kind of work around this? So this is his scan, uh, T2 weighted image, sagittal. You can see our 5S1 is dark, yeah, if whatever that means really. So reduced, reduced water content, but in terms of causal claims about pain, it's very poorly correlated with pain. But the thing is, Richard was told that his disc had been crushed and he was shown the MRI scan. It looks like it's crushed. If we look at the, uh, the other images, the axial images, we can see that there's no focal compromise um, at both L45 and L5S1. And if we look at the sacroiliac joints, there's no sign of spondyloarthropathy. So the person doing the diagnostic workup for this is very thorough. So as we all know, therapists in the room, it's a poor correlation between degenerative changes on MRI scan and symptoms. But that doesn't mean, necessarily mean that there isn't a factor to be considered. Okay, so, Richard's narrative. I will zoom this in. <laughs> Bearing in mind, when I see my patients, I've also got an hour to see them. I think that's, that's, that's a lot in today's NHS. So I just want to kind of disclaim that right now. Um, this chap was previously, he played rugby at junior level, a fractured C6, extremely uh, 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 fit chap. After this fracture of C6, he joined the parachute regiment. Did very well in the parachute regiment. When he left, he became a bodyguard, uh, involved in security services in the Middle East. I don't really know the context behind his Middle East workings. Because as the, um, we'll come back to that in a second. He, he, he was, his last job was as a doorman. His main hobby was bodybuilding. This guy was stacked. Big guy. Um, his understanding of movement, though, was purely from this idea of um, lifting and maintaining high load and weight. So his perspective of somebody who has a degenerative disc that's crushed um, and a way in which he moves is, is that it's associated with forces and heavy loads, okay? So this manifested in the way that he moved. He tended to grip, and I'll come more onto that in a second. Previous medical history, three shoulder operations. How did this all start? Five years ago, carrying some shopping back from a supermarket, slipped on the car park floor, landed on his right side. Two days later, severe low back pain with radiating symptoms as his left hip. Saw a GP, had some NSAIDs, analgesics and advice, no significant improvement, follow up in six weeks. Referred to primary care orthopaedic services, who initially managed it, seemed, seemed to manage it very well. Um, he, at the time, he wasn't keen to have um, intervention or even uh, radiological studies, because he suffered with anxiety and agoraphobia. His symptoms naturally improved, but when they returned shortly afterwards, with no history of recent injury or trauma, he became concerned, contacted his GP, and that's where we come up to the, to the story now. So he was then referred to the spinal surgeons, and the spinal surgeons gave him the news. It's a quite a difficult thing to unpick. So his difficulties include constant pain, increase on sitting to standing, sitting at rest, walking upstairs, putting socks on, bending, very, very classic features of what we see in clinical practice. He's also been off work for four, week, uh, four years. Anxious, he's become anxious, depressed, concerned about the future, increased social isolation, and feels anxiety-related symptoms are also worsening. Um, he had a partner with two children, eight and five, and he feels guilty as he's lost his sense of identity, his role and contribution. So what we did is we took all of these elements and we co-constructed a mind map where I felt from elements of the physical examination, we wrote these elements together. And I could hand this to Richard 
and what I did, I handed it to Richard after we saw him the first time, and he went away to try and make sense of it. So, because of his experience, he had a tendency to brace prior to movement, so his belief is he needed to protect the spine. Tighten the core, we've seen this before, relates to normal movement to his hobby. His hobby is lifting heavy weights. He'd not considered that low load activities are contextually different to high load activities. So it's, you don't need to brace to pick up, <coughs> pick up a pen and put on your shoes. So he had a tendency to brace. This, I believed, may increase spinal uh, muscle activity. It could therefore increase compressive load. He could sensitise his tissues from it. Because of his persistent symptoms, he may have reduced descending inhibition of pain because he had his symptoms for perhaps a period of time, but also in the context of how his understanding of his symptoms were. His symptoms became unpredictable, and therefore he became fearful of movement. He anticipated more pain, and therefore he tended to brace himself. So we were getting into this cycle, this negative cycle. And this was compounded by loss of, uh, sorry, long-term stress, a loss of identity, reduced physical activity, social isolation, low mood and anxiety. So, so he started to kind of put this picture together. So in terms of collaborative decision making, following the discussion, um, this plan was given for, uh, for him to kind of make sense of this problem with the mind map and challenge some of his beliefs about what was causing his symptoms and the fact that it wasn't necessarily the disc that was causing his problems, which is what he believed. <coughs> um, the way that he moved was addressed and how we could engage in things that were meaningful for him not a meaning, meaningful for me. So it wasn't a question of me telling him to exercise, it was a question that he wanted to exercise, and that's a key variable. We could, we could discuss the use of medications, relaxation, mindfulness through graded activity, and we applied this through a, a vector model. So what I did is I drew a line, and I talked to, and on one side there's a tendency to, uh, uh, to it's described as a tendency towards the manifestation of his symptoms, and on the other side is a tendency against the manifestation of symptoms. And we constructed these potential causal factors. Everything was tending towards it, potentially manifesting as symptoms. So what we try to do is, I mean, that's quite overwhelming. But if he could get some better understanding, what we started to do was change the tide we need to try and tip the balance towards the right, basically. And how could we have an impact on those causal factors? By doing repeated movements, reconceptualising your symptoms, and repeating them again and again and growing confidence. So try to negate his um, uh, beliefs, bearing in mind this model is very fluid. It's not something that stays static. It's very much context dependent. And if I could animate it like this, I would, but I can't. Um, so... Um, so what we did is we worked on his beliefs, we gave him a sense of control because we started to move in a different way that actually didn't sensitise him so much. We changed his provocative movement behaviour and his fear of his movements seemed to improve. Uh, his anxiety reduced and we could therefore engage in physical activity. There were some of his causal factors that I didn't think I could modify and I've highlighted them in blue. His tendency for lowness and mood, his feelings about his social status and isolation and his previous experiences. Those are things that maybe I could reconceptualise, but they're not something that I feel I could, change, I could change. And gradually, we increased his physical activity. <coughs> so in a situation where we just do pain education, we may help some of these factors. Is that enough for us to facilitate a threshold of improvement? Possibly not, because we've got too many factors which are tending towards his manifestation of back pain. So could we have improved him by giving him physical activity? Well, if we just gave him physical activity by himself, by itself in certain states, it may actually have made it worse. So by looking at it in this way, what we started to do was break down some of these causal factors, not in an irreductionist way, but in a way that came from his experience. It was an interpretive, co-constructed way in which we can engage in a process by which he felt he was in control of and he could start to map these factors out himself 
and gauge where he was in terms of these manifestations, so tendency towards and against. And he started to make some ground, and this started to head towards, although he was still suffering, he, um, was, his pain was starting to reduce. So the outcome, I mean, this is still an ongoing process, it's ex he was started to experience pain-free days, he reported reduced suffering, he started back at the gym, he wasn't confident to do free weights, but he started on machine weights, he increased his social interaction because he was engaging with the gym, he still tended to be a little bit hypervigilant, with a tendency to worry and have unhelpful thoughts and causing anxiety, and a lot of the subsequent sessions are based upon that really, and, and, um, and him coming to me about what can I do, what can't I do? And I was try I'm trying to get over to him that it's not a question of what you can't do, what you can do. It's you can do anything, but you do it slowly. I'm sure you all done familiar things. <coughs> he felt that he, um, with this approach, he recognised that there he needed some psychological support. And what started to come out was that there may have been some issues that he experienced when he was in the Middle East. So he may have suffered some form of post-traumatic stress, although I didn't get engage with that. Um, well, I did engage with it, but I didn't try to address it. He felt that he wanted to address that by seeing a professional about it. Um, he planned to see the, um, the Sisters Advice Bureau for financial advice. I still don't know the outcome of that. Um, he felt increased confidence and self-efficacy. So. These are quite familiar processes, but it's the way we think about the causal factors that I think makes a big change in the way that we conceptualise perhaps pain or what we can do to try and treat it. So the key thing, key message, Richard was at the centre of our thinking. His narrative created the context. We, respect his, we respected his right, his autonomy, his agency for him to tell me the story. We used a collaborative clinical reasoning approach, which, which we didn't want to see to act in a judgmental, fact, uh, a judgmental way. We respected his meanings and values, and they guided the rehabilitation process. Not conceptualised from my models or what I've been told works for people with back pain, driven from him, reconceptualised by us together as a partnership. We looked at relevant research to support our intervention, but it did not dictate the intervention. We do know that physical exercise is helpful, but the context and its application is down to us as a partnership. It was applied for this person in this context at this time. And it was a, it was a collaborative approach where we set some goals and, and the priority of uh, the vector model could be dependent on the power that he felt tended towards the symptoms most or the thing that he felt he could change the most. Again, he was in charge of that decision-making process. So some reflections about it. I feel, believe that it's a person-centred approach. It's collaborative, individualised. It facilitates treatment priorities. It recognises the interaction between causal factors. And we hope that it's not in a judgmental way. It's a multidimensional approach which retains fluidity. So if he has a flare-up of symptoms, we go back to those causal factors and think, what things do we think have changed? What circumstances have, to, have changed? Context, context, context. It's still work in progress. Still got things to do. Um, and uh, with, with Mick Thack, who's a good friend of Louis Gifford, you know, that, that, that idea of we, we help people using our heads, our hearts and our hands, I think is particularly appropriate. Thank you. Hi Matt, thanks a lot for a fantastic lecture and insight into how to bridge philosophy and physiotherapy. A couple of questions. First one, you did mention a little bit about categorical thinking and trying to move away from that very sensibly you presented a good account for it however with society still craving categorical thinking there is a, a gap there that needs to be bridged so the first one being how might we do that <laughs> it's a really good question and, and not easy to answer I do think that if, if we frame the, the context of the narrative you can still give an idea to the person that you're treating that there are categorical features 
Absolutely, but, but yeah. that's not representative of the whole. So you can still address their concern. Yeah, sorry, you can still address their thinking, i.e. categorical, i.e. Um, disc prolapse necessitating ridiculous pain, which of course it doesn't all the time. Um, you can still account for that, but you can just frame it differently, and that's why I think this approach is different. And explaining that within the context which you also mentioned. Now, sorry to be, this is a, this is a bit of a cruel question in, a, in okay. our usual style, but it, off the back of that, you did mention that you've got a 60 minute uh, appointment time, which is, which is and you admitted that that's, that's right. novel yeah. in this day and age. However, yeah. if we were to therefore start to narrow that, start to eat away at that, unfortunately, like the political and economic circumstances have dictated, where do you feel the priority lies in, in that? And what has to give? I think um, I think you're going to struggle doing the approach that I've described in in less time. So therefore, I think we've got to think about what what are our priorities with somebody who's got um, an ever increasing social economic burden on our society, who's using uh, lots of healthcare resources and ways in which we engage with that person actually long term to reduce that burden. So we invest to save. Absolutely. Now, the context around the patient, and you presented a fantastic view of, of how that influenced that gentleman. The context around the therapist that we've just alluded to, those meetings of worlds, is, is tricky. Now, might that be one of the key reasons, and I, I know that it's unfair to call it a key reason, it's one of many, that the context around the therapist might be then narrowing someone down their favourite line of reasoning. So you might narrow someone into structuralism, or you might yes. narrow someone into pseudo-psychology, for want yes. of a better term, yeah. and they, they, they simply narrow their view and give a causal link. So I don't want to put words in your mouth, but might, yeah. might that be one of the factors? Well, that, that possibly happens in practice already. Mm. Um, and I think... Um, if we use, I think, some of the advantage of using and giving the, the person the um, mind map and the vector model, which they map themselves, they prioritize the treatment. So it's very much led by them. Sometimes we can't change the way people think, and I don't think we should put ourselves underneath that pressure. But if we can recontextualize what they believe the problem is and ways that we can counteract it, uh, and add to factors which can be to the person's advantage or subtract factors which we feel are adding to their condition, I think that that is going to be a way that's be fruitful for Fantastic, both yeah. for, for the patient and, and, and for the therapeutic relationship. Absolutely, and, and I think, and I agree, I think, I'm not yet lucky enough to have spent any time with you in practice, but I can imagine that you, you're very, very rare that you would encounter a roadblock using the approach that you use, and I try my best to, to be as you and as malt be as I can. However, <laughs> When, say, there are occasions where, despite best efforts, someone is wanting, continue to want to attribute causation to one particular thing, let's go easy and say structure, is it sometimes therefore warranted to meet them in that falsehood in order to try and maintain that therapeutic alliance? Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, we, we would have to look at ways in which we can create some cognitive dissonance. Not in a threatening way, not in a way that we can, uh, again, you know, I talk about judgment quite a bit, not in a non-judgmental way, but in a way in which um, we can prove the opposite uh, is, is true, perhaps, for their experience. So, for example, a very easy way is, you know, I've got a disc prolapse, that's why it hurts when I bend forwards. Well, if we put that into a different context and they can flex forwards in less pain or, or, or are able to do it pain-free, it's no different yeah. to what we do in clinical practice. No, reframe and, it and then and replay it back. Right. And, 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 the, diff the difficulty is, is getting the, the person to engage in that process and I think it, if, you can't, if you can't deal with it head on, we'd we then we'd have to look at um, the, the, the other causal factors as a priority. So if we feel that they are non-modifiable factors, which I think we discussed, and one of their factors, that one of their non-modifiable factors is belief, it's a very strong causal power. Um, so in the model that I used to describe causal factors having driving context from a top-down versus a bottom-up model. Um, it's going to be a challenge, but we have to work around it. And um, therefore, I would suggest using you know, different factors and identify the things that we think are modifiable for them. And sometimes it's contextual in terms of time. So that person may not be ready to engage or change. That's OK. It's patient-led. Absolutely. They're, 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 they're dictating the pace as well as everything else. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your time. No worries.